times do we fall on our knees and we say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. And we feel as if we're not forgiven. This is a deception of Satan himself to allow us to dictate whether or not God can forgive us based on our feelings. Welcome to Amazing Discoveries. My name is Loami Richardson, Evangelist for Soul Outreach, and I'm excited to, to bring you this 10-part uh, series entitled The Struggle is Real. I don't know about you, but I realized about six years ago when I first gave my heart to Jesus, I thought that everything was going to go smooth sailing. There was going to be no struggles. Just give your all to Jesus, right? And so when I gave my heart to Jesus in the form of baptism, it was about six months after that experience that I realized that, man, I was struggling. And I was struggling with things that I never thought I would, uh, that, that I thought I fully surrendered to Jesus. But um, as the more that I prayed, the more that I studied, I realized that temptations can continue to overwhelm me. I continued to fall and I didn't have this experience that I thought that I was supposed to receive when I first gave my heart to Jesus. But the more that I studied, the more that I prayed, I realized that the struggle is something beautiful. The struggle is an indicator, brothers and sisters, of our reality of Jesus' love in our hearts. And so what we're going to be doing throughout this 10-part series, the first three, we're going to be discussing more of a doctrinal, uh, we're going to have a, uh, a doctrinal foundation as we discuss the story of Nicodemus, the rich young ruler, entitled You Had One Job, which was, is going to be today's lecture. Then we're going to talk about the 10 virgins, the importance of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, the message of Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean church, we're going to just dive into that and go unpack that. But then afterwards, we're going to go into a seven-step um, a seven step series entitled seven steps to completion, which we're going to take the message of Christ, our righteousness and make it very practical for us to go through and understand to better help our Christian experience with Christ. But before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for your abundant grace, your mercy and your love. And Lord, as we unpacked the first study of this 10 part series, we pray that your Holy Spirit may help us to understand our need of you. Lord, the one thing that you desire is our hearts. And Lord, as we look at the stories of the rich young ruler and Nicodemus, I pray that we may uh, do the one thing that you desire for us to do, and that is to understand your love for us and that we may surrender our hearts to you. We love you. We thank you. We ask that you may bless us with your spirit to help us understand these truths that we're going to share here and now. Hide me behind the cross. Let your son be uplifted. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So as you see, the title of today's presentation is You Had One Job. And so as I was thinking about this title, I was doing a little bit of research and I was wondering, well, what are some other jobs that people had that they needed to do and ultimately failed? And I was researching, I realized that this individual had one job and he was supposed to write school instead of uh, uh, to, to write the word school to indicate that the area he's in is a school zone. But instead of writing school, he writes school. S-H-C-O-O-L. Apparently, he must have skipped some classes there. And so we see that this gentleman had one job, and he failed at the one job that it was given to him. I don't know about you, but I love exercising. And one of the joys that I've seen a lot of people uh, partake in is bicycle riding. And so can you imagine as you're taking your bicycle, and you're riding with your friends or your partner, and, and you realize that there was a road that's going to tell you to go this way, but instead of going in a straight path, there's railings that is there to kind of hinder your, your, your path there as you're riding. Uh, you would tell that's going to be a very rough experience there. This gentleman clearly had one job and failed in that one job. Also, the one thing, I, I, I went to the store not too long ago, and as I went, I went, to tar, uh, uh, I went to Target, and I realized that there was a sign there, and it said, do not enter, but at the same time, it says, enter only. And I was sitting there confused, not knowing what, what to do, and, and I sat there waiting and contemplating until I finally saw the door open out, and I realized, okay, that's the enter sign, let me enter in. But brothers and sisters, one of, the, one of, the, one of my joys that I enjoy uh, watching is the Olympics that happens every four years. And one of my favorite athletes that I was looking forward to uh, watching was Michael Phelps and Usain Bolt. And one of the pride of every Olympic athlete is to represent not only their family themselves, but their country. And I can imagine as uh, Michael Phelps, as he wins the gold medal, as he's there representing the United States, as he uh, hears the national anthem being played and he bows his head and they give him the, uh, the medallion, we see that he won first place. You see, the person that was supposed to put the number one, but instead he put the number three. And so he received a first place medallion. 
Brothers and sisters, all of these individuals had one job, but they failed in that one job. And so what we're going to be discussing today in today's lecture is the importance of understanding and knowing our need. It's the struggle of really knowing our need of Jesus. But in order for us to know our need, brothers and sisters, we must first understand our condition. You see, there's no way possible that you and I can give the remedy of the gospel or understand the remedy of the gospel if first we do not understand our condition. And in order for us to understand our condition, we must go turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. So if you have your Bibles, just turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. As we see the last letter, uh, a letter written um, to the last day church called the Laodicean church. And if your Bible is just like mine, you will see that the words are written in red. And if they're written in red, that means that's one person that's speaking specifically, and that man is no other than Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice what Jesus has to say about God's last day church right before he comes. If you again, it's Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. It says, and the angel of the church of the Laodiceans writes, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of all the creation of God. Verse 15. Notice what Jesus says about his last day church. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, and I could wish you were cold or hot. You see, God is looking at his last day's church. Jesus, the one who died for us, is saying, listen, I know your works. You may put on a good show on the outward, but inwardly you're struggling. Inwardly, you pretend to be hot, but inside you're completely cold. And God's great desire in verse 15 is that I wish that you were cold or hot. But notice verse 16. It states, and so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Some translation says, I will spew you out of my mouth. And I've always wrestled with this text. How is it that Jesus, the, the God who loves us, who cares for us, who died for us, how does he look at us and get to a point that he wants to vomit us out of his mouth? Well, the answer is found in the very next verse. Notice what it says in verse 17. Because you say. Who says it? I say it. You say it. God's church says that we are rich, we have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And because Jesus knows our true works, because Jesus knows what's going on in our hearts. Notice what he says. He says, I have nothing. Uh, we say that we're rich, have become wealthy, and have no need of nothing. And we do not know that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, the reason why Jesus, the God of love, the God who died for us, the God who created us out of the dust of the ground and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, the reason why God can look at you and I and get to a point that he wants to spew us out of his mouth is because we think we're better than we are. You see, it says that we think that we're rich, we're increased with goods and we don't need anything, but God looks at us and he realizes that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, I thank God that sometimes he reveals our condition, but I praise God even more that he doesn't have to leave us in that condition, amen? Notice what it says in verse 18. The good doctor, Jesus, he tells us of our condition called the Laodicean condition. And he tells us in verse 18, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in fire. Why? Why would God want us to buy gold from him? Because he realizes that you and I are not rich and he wants us to become rich. And so that's why he says, buy of me gold so that way you may become rich. And then he wants us to buy white garments. Why? Because we and I are both naked. And so he says, he wants us to buy gold refined in the fire, white garments that we, you and I, can be clothed and that the shame of the nakedness may not be revealed. And then Christ wants us to anoint our eyes with eye salve that we may see. Why? So because the reality of truth, brothers and sisters, is that you and I are blind. But brothers and sisters, verse 19 tells us the reason why Jesus had to be so direct in the message that he's giving us. Notice what it says in verse 19. As many as I what? It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So we're seeing that the reason why God tells us our condition isn't to make us feel bad about ourselves, but for us to understand our desperate need of him. And so he says, listen, I want you to buy of me gold, buy of me uh, clothing, buy of me eye salve that you may see. And I'm telling you this because I love you. 
I'm telling you this so that way you can be zealous for me and repent from your life of sin. And notice the reason why we're in this condition, brothers and sisters. It's right here in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You see, the reason why you and I have come to a point where we think that we're rich, increased with goods and no need of anything is because we have allowed Jesus to be outside of our hearts and not in. It states that, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And so, brothers and sisters, we see here in Revelation chapter 3 that our condition is that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And when I came to this realization, I was prompted to ask the question, just like the rich young ruler asked, well, then what should I do to inherit eternal life? And so what we're going to take a look at, we're going to take a look at two stories found in the Bible, one of the rich young ruler and one of the man called Nicodemus. And we're going to see that both of these gentlemen were both rich, increased with goods, and had no need of anything until they came to Jesus and they realized that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 18, verse 18, as we see the, interactive, the interaction between Jesus and the rich young ruler. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 18, verse 18. And notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, and verse 18. It says, now a certain ruler asked him, saying, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't know about you, but we've all come to a point in our experience where we ask the same question. Now that I see my condition, now that I'm seeing that I'm wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, what can I do to be saved? And so we see this man, this Laodicean man, who was rich, increased with goods, and no need of anything, Ultimately, ultimately, ask God, what should I do to inherit eternal life? But to get a little context as to why he asked this question, we look at verse 15 of Luke chapter 18. It says, then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. That, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. And Jesus called to them and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. And assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as little children will by no means enter it. And so the rich young ruler heard how Jesus interacted uh, to the children. And he says, wow, how can I enter into the kingdom of God? So he goes to God, Jesus and he only acknowledges him as a good teacher. Well, any good teacher, you know, is always going to teach a lesson. Amen. So notice what Jesus does in verse 19, the good teacher. Notice what he does in verse 19. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. In other words, rich young ruler, do you understand who you're talking to? I'm not just a good moral teacher. I am the son of God. And I'm going to make you a believer once this conversation is over. And so he says, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, in verse 20, notice what it says. Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your, mother, your father and your mother. And so the rich young ruler, knowing that he memorized the whole Old Testament by memory by the age of 12, he realized that, hold up, I've been keeping the commandments ever since I was young. But I want you to notice in verse 20 that when Jesus told him to keep the commandments, he only specifies five. Now, we know that the commandments are broken down into two points, uh, commandments to God, how we serve God. And then the last six are our service to, to man. And so when he says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, the rich young ruler immediately understood, hold up, Jesus left one out. And so notice the response in verse 21. The rich young ruler, once he understand what Jesus was doing, notice his response. And he said, all these things I have kept from a what? From a youth. And then we see in verse 22 that Jesus says, he heard these things and he says, you still lack how many things? One thing. I want, to, I want you to notice what Christ's Object Lessons states in page 391. It says his conception of the law was external and superficial. Judged by a human standard, he had preserved an unblemished record or character. So we see that his conception of the God's law was one that was superficial, one that was external, but he was judging himself according to other people. So we see that the problem with the rich young ruler wasn't that he was comparing his life to the law of God, but that he was looking at the law of God as something external, something superficial, and that he was judging it based on a human standard, based on how other people was keeping God's law. And as he was looking at other, other human beings keeping the law of God, he came to the conclusion that, man, I'm pretty good. 
I'm not better than this person. I'm, I'm much better than this person. Notice what it continues to state. To a great degree, his outward life had been free from guilt. He verily thought that his obedience had been without flaw. He came to a conclusion that his life was perfect. He saw that his outward life was according to God's standard and God's will, but then he realized there was still something missing. Notice what it says as it concludes. Yet he had a secret fear. What was that fear? That all was not right between his soul and God. And so we see that the rich young ruler, as Jesus is telling him his condition, he says, if you want to inherit eternal life, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, just like these little children have a part of my kingdom, then I want you to keep the commandments of God. Bear, uh, 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 do these things and you'll enter in. But the rich young ruler thought he himself to be better than what, than, than what Jesus was telling him he was. And so we see that he was struggling with something. He realized not everything that he thought was cracked up to be, was the reality in his experience. He realized that in his heart, there was something lacking. And you see, brothers and sisters, this is why in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, it states the following. Notice what Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 states. It states in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, it says the following. It says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but his end is the way of what? It says death. So the rich young ruler was walking down a path that he thought was okay, but it was really leading him to a path of death. And this is why, as he was examining himself, he realized there's something lacking. But when he was, ex when he was ex um, examining himself to other people that, that claim to hold, uh, hold true to the word of God, he realized, well, I'm much better than everyone else. And this is why 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 tells us what we should not be doing. Notice what 2 Corinthians chapter... 10 and verse 12 says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, notice what the Bible states, because this is what the rich young ruler was doing. Notice what it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, the Bible says they are not wise. So if you and I come to a point where we can think that we can compare ourselves, our lives to everyone else, the Bible says we are not wise in doing so. And so here it is that the rich young ruler wasn't examining his life to the law of God. He was examining his life to the other Pharisees and other believers around him. And as he did that, he realized, well, I must be better than everyone else. But the Bible says we do not compare ourselves with anyone else. If we do so, we are not wise in doing it. And so I want you to notice what Desire of Ages states as Jesus is, is having this conversation with him. See, Christ read the ruler's heart. Only how many things? One thing. He had one job, one thing he lacked. And notice the thing he lacked. But this was a vital principle. So what was the one thing that was lacking in the rich young ruler experience? He needed the love of God in the soul. There we see. We see that the rich young ruler had an understanding of the law of God. Externally, he seemed to understand how to keep it, and he compared himself to everyone else, and he says, hey, I'm better than everyone else. But the one thing, the one thing that he was lacking was the love of God in the soul. And notice what it says. This lack, unless applied, will prove fatal to him. His whole nature would be corrupted. By indulgence, selfishness was strengthened that he might receive the love of God. Notice what must be suppressed. His supreme love of self must be surrendered. And so we see that the rich young ruler, he compared himself to everyone else and he thought himself to be better than everyone. But when he came to the point where he realized there's something lacking in my experience, he said, I kept the commandments since I was a youth. I've gone to church. I've gone to Sabbath school. I participated in service. I was even in the church choir. There is still something lacking in my experience. And we see that the one thing that was lacking in his experience was a love for God. And unless the love of God was in his heart and his love for himself was suppressed, he was going to ultimately uh, deal with the consequences of this dangerous path that was going to lead him to death. And so this is why it states in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have what? If you have love for one another. This is how we know 
that we are true disciples of Jesus Christ is how we respond to other people and how we respond in when they do us wrong, how we respond in those moments where it's called to hate when God calls us to love. So the question is, if the one vital thing that the rich young ruler was lacking in his experience was the love of God, then the logical question we have to ask is, what is love? And the only way that you and I can understand what love is, is if we go to the love chapter. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. And so what we're going to do is look at the principles of love found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, the English language does a very disservice in the word love. I remember talking to one of my students before, and she says, man, I love French fries. French fries is my favorite food. And I must admit, I love French fries as well. But then as she's conversating, she says, and I love my mother as well. I was like, I was thinking to myself, well, does she love French fries as much as she loves her mom? Uh, I hope not. Well, maybe. I don't know. Some people may love French fries more than they love their parents. But the problem is that the English language does a, a service, a disservice, when it comes to explaining love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 explains what love is. And so we're going to look at the principles and understand, as we read that quotation before, the one vital thing that the rich young ruler was lacking was the love of God in his heart. And so if you and I are lacking in our experience, if we're realizing that there's something that's just not, it's just, there's no connection, there's no spark, it seems like we're going through the, through the emotions of our Christian and religious experience, then we have to analyze ourselves and say, well, am I comparing myself to others or am I comparing myself to the law of God and is the love of God in my heart? And so, brothers and sisters, this is, the, this is the test. If we fail in any of these points, then it's safe to say that you and I are lacking in the love of God in our hearts. So notice, 1 Corinthians says that love suffers long. How many times do we go to work, go to school? There may be coworkers or even classmates that bothers us. And we say, man, if you say one more word, I'm going to have to pop you in the mouth. We might have to get into a fight. But what the Bible says, love suffers long. And we see that sometimes in our experience, we don't necessarily suffer long with those who do us bad or who, who, does, who does evil to us. We, we at times don't suffer long with those who are called to, uh, for us to be patient. But notice, it says that love is kind. Do we say a kind word to those who frustrate us? Do we show kindness to others who don't deserve it? How about this? It says love does not envy. Uh-oh. We may be pressing, we may be stepping on some toes now. Because I know that there's some people that I know that, that get envious about the positions that they have. How did this person get this position at my job? I've been here for 15 years. I've worked hard. And this person works half as hard as me. But because he knows somebody, he was able to get that promotion. But the Bible says that love does not envy. Love does not envy of people's positions or possessions. Uh-oh. If we think we're passing the test so far, how about this one? Love says it does not parade itself. And if you open up your Facebook app or your Instagram or your Twitter, the very first thing, the very eight, eight out of the 10 pictures that I see are all selfies. <laughs> People taking pictures of themselves, look at talking and, and, and bragging about the things that they, they, they own and, and uh, the, all the places that they, that they are uh, traveling to and all the food that they're eating. But we see that the Bible says love does not parade itself. It does not boast about itself. And this is why it states also that love is not puffed up, puffed up. But also, love does not behave rudely. Uh-oh. Man, listen, I must testify. I realized there was a situation in my life that I was not demonstrating the love of God. As I was at a restaurant, we waited 45 minutes for us to be served. And when we got there, the waitress was rude. And so the way that we responded back wasn't with kindness and love. We, we, we showed a little bit of rudeness as well. We didn't tip her as, as well as she should have. And I remember as I went back home, I had to repent for that. Because I realized, Lord, is the one thing lacking in my life, the love of you in my heart. And so we see that love does not behave rudely. Love is not provoked. Oh, brothers and sisters, how many times are we provoked into jealousy, provoked into anger? I remember my experience growing up, my mother was saying, I wouldn't have yelled at you if you would have done just as I told you to do if you didn't provoke me to anger. But love is not provoked. But notice, love thinks no evil. If we thought that we passed the test, Brothers and sisters, my question to you this, uh, uh, right now is, have you thought about evil today? And, and if you thought about evil, did you fall into that evil? Because love does not rejoice in iniquity. And how many times in our experience are we tempted with sin and we ask ourselves, man, I love this sin to the point that we cave into that sin. 
But brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is that love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love uh, believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. And love never fails. But notice what it says in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. And now abide in faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is what? It's love. Why is it that love never fails? Why is the greatest out of all of these three attributes or these, uh, why is hope, love, and faith, why is love the greatest? It's because of 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He who does not love does not know God. For why? For God is what? Is love. And brothers and sisters, we have found the solution to the problem. We are lacking the love of God in our hearts. And we're going through the emotions of thinking that we're keeping God's law. We go, we go to church on the right day. We're eating the right food. We dress right. But there's something lacking that we realize if Jesus would come today, I will be completely lost. And so we see that the rich young ruler, he was rich, increased with goods. And the one thing that was fatal to him, if it, unless applied, was the love of God in his heart. And so we see, brothers and sisters, in 1 Corinthians 13, it describes what love is. And, and you have to ask yourself, is it? Is the love of God in my heart? Am I demonstrating true love for others and for my maker? This is why Thoughts of the Mount of Blessing, page 25, states the following. Unless you accept in your own life the principle of self-sacrificing love, which is the principle of his character, it says you may not know God. No, it says you cannot know God. Brothers and sisters, unless we accept in our life the principle of love, the principle laid out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, unless we understand the character of God, it states you and I cannot know who God is. And this is why sons and daughters states in page 49, many are deceiving themselves for the principle of love does not abide or dwell in their hearts. There are, and last time I checked, many is a lot, it's not a few. Many are deceiving themselves thinking that they're on the way to heaven when in reality, the principle of love, the vital thing that is needed in their experience is lacking in their hearts. Notice what it says in evangelism, page 152. I wish you to distinctly understand this point, that souls are kept from obeying the truth by a what? A confusion of ideas and also because they do not know how to surrender their wills and their minds to Jesus. And notice what it concludes by stating. They want special instruction how to become Christians. So we see that the overall problem in, in the Christian world today is that we do not understand how to fully surrender our wills, how to surrender our minds, how to fully understand the instructions how to become Christians. See, and this is what happened to me six years ago. They said, well, just give your heart to Jesus. Okay, didn't know what that meant. But they said, well, the way that you give your heart to Jesus is by baptism. So I got baptized. I came out feeling great. They said, well, the way to, for you to obtain that relationship with God is to pray and to study your Bible and to, and to witness and evangelize. So I did so. And so, but, but after that, after I continued to pray and, and study and share, I realized to myself, is this all the Christian experience is about? Because there was moments where I was wrestling and giving in, uh, wrestling with temptation, and I did not know how to surrender my heart, my will. Why? Because the love of God wasn't dwelt in my heart, wasn't dwelling in my heart. And so we see that they want special instruction how to become Christians. And brothers and sisters, I hope by the end of this series, you will understand how to surrender your hearts and minds to Jesus. Hopefully this, this presentation in this series will help you how you and I can become better Christians. And so we see, brothers and sisters, that the rich young ruler, as he was uh, uh, seeing his, his need for Jesus, I want you to go back to Luke chapter 18, because notice a response as Jesus was telling him about his condition. Luke chapter 18. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And notice what it says in 18. Notice how the story concludes. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus said, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. You see, the rich young ruler had one job, one job, and the one job was for him to surrender his heart to Jesus. And so Jesus was exposing himself that his problem was that he loved his possessions more than he loved Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, if you want to be a disciple, if you want to be a follower of mine, you must surrender that one thing that will keep you from entering to heaven. Sell all that you had. That was a test. 
give to the poor, come and follow me. And you would think, brothers and sisters, if, think about this for a second. If an angel, your guardian angel came down from heaven <laughs> and told you, listen, you are beloved Loami. You are, you, you, all of the universe is watching you and we're rooting for you. And I just want to let you know that 99%, you are 99% where you need to be. Man, how many of us will be excited about that? 99%, I'm almost there. I'm, I'm thinking I'm at least 17, 18%, not 99. But imagine your guardian angels telling you, you are 99% where you need to be. And there's only one thing that you must surrender. How many of us will be excited about that news? I know I would be. I would be like, tell me the one thing. But we see the one thing that was revealed to the rich young ruler. Notice his response in verse 23. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very, what? Rich. You see, he was rich, increased with goods, no need of anything. Once Jesus told him that he was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, we see that the rich young ruler looked at the love of God. He looked at what Jesus was offering him and he looked at his possessions and he says, I love my possessions more than I love him. And he went away sorrowful in his experience. The reason why he went away sorrowful, the reason why he continues to, uh, uh, to struggle in his experience is because he did not know how to surrender the one thing that was needed for him to be complete in Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, this was the experience of the rich young ruler. This is the experience that many are having today. But I want you to notice another example. And the other example is found in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is uh, uh, talking about the, uh, the, uh, Nicodemus. And I want you to notice in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Here's another gentleman that was rich, increased with goods, and no need of anything. And I want you to notice in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Notice what it states in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, you, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. So we see that Nicodemus, another Pharisee, one who was rich, increased with goods, and he felt like he had no need of anything, came to Jesus at night. And it's interesting, all of these individuals come to Jesus where no one can see them or they just acknowledge him as a good teacher. But now we're seeing, well, we know that you're a good teacher for the simple fact that you can perform miracles. I want you to notice what it states here in Desire of Ages, page 171. It says he was, he was a, stri a strict Pharisee, talking about Nicodemus, and prided himself on his good works. He was widely esteemed for his benevolence and his liberality in sustaining the temple service. And he felt secure of the favor of God. He was startled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to see in his present state. Well, what condition was he in? Notice what it says in John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus had the audacity to tell this rich young ruler or uh, 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 this, this man who was rich in creature gives and no need of anything, Nicodemus, that unless he was converted, unless he was baptized again by the spirit of God, he can no way enter into the kingdom of God. He thought to himself, I'm too good. How is it that I can't make it into heaven? That's the attitude and the mindset that he had. He thought he was too pure. He thought that he was in favor of God. He thought that he was like, listen, I'm too good. And I want you to notice what it states here in Desire of Ages, what it continues to state. He felt that he needed no change. Hence, he, his surprise at the Savior's words. He was irritated by their close application to himself. Notice, the pride of the Pharisee was struggling against the honest desire of the seeker at the truth. He wondered that Christ should speak to him as he did, not respecting his position as ruler in Israel. And then we see that the struggle was real for Nicodemus. He realized that pride was battling with, his, uh, with, with, the, uh, uh, ob uh, with the objective of him surrendering that, at that very moment. You see, Nicodemus responded in John chapter 3, verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You see, he was trying to fight back what the spirit was convicting him to do. The pride of his heart was struggling with the desire of surrendering everything to Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters, the struggle is real. It is real. Every single time we come closer and closer to God, God is revealing to us more about ourselves. And there we realize that we're struggling against our pride, against what God is desiring us 
to ultimately surrender. And so we see that the story continues in John chapter 3 and verse 3 through 7. Notice, it says that most assuredly I say to him, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus then replies by saying, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a, uh, into a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and under spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It states in verse 6 that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then notice what he says in verse 7, what Jesus said. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. So brothers and sisters, don't be surprised. Don't marvel that Jesus is telling you and I the same thing. You and I must be born again. We must be born of the Spirit. We must be born of God's Holy Spirit power. And we see that that uh, the verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that those who are born again walked not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit of the living God. And this is what, the, uh, uh, this is what Nicodemus was wrestling with. This is what he was struggling with, his pride of self or surrendering to Jesus and what he was telling him at that very moment. Notice what it says in Desire of Ages, page 171. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is in tempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has a merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. And notice what it states. The Christian life is not a modification or an improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. So, brothers and sisters, we see that most of our lives have just been a modification or an improvement of our own lifestyles. But have we experienced a true transformation of nature? You see, I stopped drinking. You see, I stopped, eat, I stopped eating the foods that they told me not to eat. I stopped dressing right. But brothers and sisters, I was just modifying the behavior. What I needed was a transformation in my life because the end of the day, I wasn't dying to self. I was still wrestling, but I was caving into to those, to those carnal desires that was in my heart. And I want you to notice what Bible Commentary Volume 6 states. The new birth is such a rare experience in this age of the world. This is the reason why there's so many perplexities in the churches. Do we see perplexities in the churches today? The answer is yes. And notice, many, so many, who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. Have mercy. But I want you to notice, when I read this quotation, I'll be honest, I had to close my Bible and I had to get on my knees and say, Lord, pray. For, I ask that you may dwell in my heart. Lord, be with those who are trying to do right by you. Because notice what it says. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Why? Many who are going into the baptismal pools are going into it thinking that they're going to be coming out transformed and, tra and, and renewed. But notice why they were buried alive is because self did not die. And therefore, they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. So think about this for a moment. You were taught before you were baptized to leave the sins of the world. They said, Loami, you need to stop smoking. I stopped smoking. Loami, you need to stop drinking. I stop drinking. Luami, you need to stop committing adultery. I stop committing adultery. Luami, you need to stop stealing. I stop stealing. And they told me all of these external things that I needed to give up. But I ask you this question. How many of you who have been baptized were taught how to die to self and to give up the right of all of the heart sins that are possessed in your heart? You know, the hatred that you have for your brother. You know, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the impatience, the irritation, the jealousy. How about the selfishness? See, this is our problem. So few have understood how to surrender their heart with all of the heart sins. As long as we feel that we're not committing these exterior sins, we think that we're good Christians. But, and, and in those moments where I had resentment, in those moments where I was impatient, I made excuses for those defective characters by saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just merely human. You know, I'm just a human being. But brothers and sisters, but when I surrendered my whole heart to God, it was at that very moment that I realized that God can cleanse me from all of my sins. And this is why 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from some sin. It says from all sin. 
Jesus is willing to cleanse you from all of your sin. But notice what it says in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. It says, brothers and sisters, from all unrighteousness. Christ can make you anew. You don't have to struggle with those sins anymore. You can give those to Jesus. He says if you confess, he will forgive, he will cleanse, and he will restore you. This is why it says in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, when we accept Christ into our lives, we become new creatures. My old life, my old habits are done away with. All of a sudden, I am transformed into the image of Jesus. This is why Review and Herald states the following. That which was objectionable in the character is purified from the soul by what? By the love of Jesus. The one thing that is crucial, that is needed in our lives is the love of Jesus. Notice, all selfishness is expelled. All envy, all evil speaking is rooted out. And a radical transformation is wrought in the heart. You see what the love of Jesus can do? It can expel all the selfishness, all the envying, all the evil speaking that we have towards other people. And we see that it's not just a modification, but a complete transformation of our hearts. But you notice, it says that many who profess to follow Christ have not genuine religion. They do not reveal in their lives the fruit of true conversion. Why? Because they are controlled by the same habits, the same spirit of fault finding and selfishness which controlled them before they accepted Christ. And it concludes by saying that no one can enter the city of God who has not a knowledge of genuine conversion. In true conversion, what happens? The soul is born again. A new spirit takes possession of the temple of the soul. A new life begins, and then Christ is revealed. Where and through? It's through the character. See, brothers and sisters, people don't want to know how much knowledge you know of the scriptures. They want to see a transformed life. Are you humble? Are you, are you loving? Are you caring? Are you long-suffering? These are the fruits that demonstrate whether or not you and I are true disciples of Jesus. But you don't have to take the word of inspiration. Notice what Paul states in Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. For the law, for what the law cannot do, what is it the law cannot do? It cannot save you, right? In that it was weak through the flesh, what is it that, what is it that you and I are not capable of doing? We're not able to keep the law of God. So what the law cannot do, which is save us, what we are not capable of doing, which is keeping it, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And what did he do? He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after what? The spirit. Goes back to John chapter 3. You must be born again. You have to be born both of the water and of the spirit of God. And so understand what the law cannot do is save me. What I'm not capable of doing is keeping the law. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, came, lived a life of obedience to God, and in his life, he condemned sin in the flesh. And when I accept Christ into my life, notice, the law of God is now fulfilled in my life. Why? Because it's no longer I who is doing it, but Christ is doing it, uh, doing it in me. Amen? I want you to notice what Thoughts of the Mount of Blessing, page 34 states, 54 states. While the law is holy, the Jews cannot obtain the righteousness by their own efforts to keep the law. The disciples of Christ must obtain righteousness of a different character from that of the Pharisees. If they would enter the kingdom of heaven, God offered them in his son the perfect righteousness of the law. If they would open their hearts fully to receive Christ, then the very life of God, his love, will dwell in them, transforming them into his own likeness. And thus, through God's free gift, they would possess the righteousness which the law requires a reproduction in themselves of the character of Christ. And this is what Jesus was offering the rich young ruler. This is what Jesus was offering to Nicodemus. This is what Jesus was offering to the Jewish nation. And brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus is offering to you and I. You see, you and I are not capable of keeping the law of God. Not the way that God intended for us to keep it. But you see, we have kept the law externally, superficially, and we compare ourselves to other people. and We say, well, at least I don't go to the movies. Well, at least I don't drink. At least I don't smoke. I must be better than them. And we see that the Bible states that is not wise for us to do. But through God's free gift, the righteousness that is required for us to enter into heaven, brothers and sisters, it's offered by the free gift of Jesus. 
And as he enters into our hearts, he reproduces in us a character that reveals the love of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, when Nicodemus started to understand his condition and what Jesus was offering, I want you to notice what Desire of Ages, page 175 says. Nicodemus started searching the scriptures in a new way, not for discussion of theory, but in order to receive life for the soul. He wasn't studying anymore to try to prove doctrinal discourses. He was trying to find the words of life. And this is why we forget that John chapter 3, verse 16 was in context of what he was talking. Uh, in the, it was in the context of the conversation he was having with Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, my father loved you so much that he sent me to save you. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to save you. I came to love you. I understand what you're wrestling with. I understand the sins that you continue to fall into, but I did not come to condemn. I came to save. And once Nicodemus understood that that message was for him, it changed his life forever. He started searching the scriptures in a new way, not for theory, but to receive the words of life in his soul. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the spirit was leading him into all truth. He was understanding the love that Jesus had for him and what Jesus wants to do in his life. But notice what Step to Christ states. We have flattered ourselves, as did Nicodemus, that our life has been upright, that our moral character is correct. And we think that we need not to humble the heart before God like the common sinner. You see, our natural disposition is to be like Nicodemus. We flatter ourselves into thinking, oh, well, I'm good. I have a good moral character. I think I'm okay. I don't need to humble my heart before God. But notice what takes place. But when, oh, brothers and sisters, but when the light from Christ shines into our souls, we shall discern the selfishness of motive, the enmity against God that has defiled the very act of life. Is when we see the cross, is when we see the life of the love of Jesus as he stretched out his arms for you and I, is at that very place is where we're able to discern the selfishness of my motive heart, that I was my enmity against God and how I defiled myself with every temptation that I fell into. But notice, it's when I realize my nothingness is when I see the beauty of the cross. It's at that point that we shall know that our righteousness is indeed as filthy rags and that the blood of Christ alone can cleanse us from the defilement of sin and renew our hearts in his own likeness. Brothers and sisters, it's not until we look at the cross, it's not until we see Jesus for who he truly is that we will see our nothingness, that we'll see all of our right doing is indeed filthy rags. And it's only by the blood of Jesus that allows us to be cleansed from every sin that is in our lives. Brothers and sisters, can I tell you a little bit more about Nicodemus? You see, Nicodemus, as he heard this message, he was the only one who offered money for the tomb of Jesus. It was him that provided the tomb in which our Savior lays his head, where he laid his head. Brothers and sisters, when you read the Acts of the Apostles, it, the early church was struggling. <laughs> they were struggling to try to get this message forward. And do you want to know who supplied the funds for them to continue to move forward? It was the funds of Nicodemus. He sold everything that he had, brothers and sisters, so that way the gospel of the good news and the love of Jesus can go throughout the entire world. You see, Nicodemus understood his need of Christ. So we see the two parallels of these stories. We see the rich young ruler and we see Nicodemus, both rich, increased with goods and no need of anything. And when Jesus says, listen, the reality is you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Once they understood the condition, there's only two responses. Do we surrender to God and allow his love to transform us? to allow the good fruits that he wants to produce in us so that others can see that we are truly disciples of Jesus? Or do we walk away sorrowful? Because that one thing that Jesus is telling us to surrender, we do not want to surrender. This is why Jesus says, if you love your mom more than you love me, you're not worthy. If you love your father, if you love your husband, your wife, your kids, if you love them more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. And we see that the rich young ruler loved his possessions more than he loved Jesus. And he walked away sorrowful in his experience. But when Nicodemus saw that it doesn't matter about my possessions, it doesn't matter about my titles. What I want is a love in my heart. I want to be renewed. I want to be transformed. Is when he understood his lack and his need is when Christ was able to supply. And so we see, brothers and sisters, that a great question that we should ask ourselves as we conclude is a great burden of every soul should be this. Is my heart renewed? 
Is my soul transformed? Are my sins pardoned through the faith in Christ? Have I been born again? That's the question. Has my heart been renewed by the love of Jesus? Has been my soul been transformed by his love? Have the sins that I've been holding on to for all these years, have I confessed them so that Christ can forgive me for them? But the last question that we should ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, have I been truly been born again? Have I been renewed by his love? Am I producing the fruits that are necessary for others to see his love in my heart? And how do we get to that point, brothers and sisters? There's no other than looking at the cross. It's looking at the great sacrifice that Jesus was willing to offer in laying down his life for you and I. As the old hymn states, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Have you beheld Christ? Do you understand his love for you? Has his love transformed you to want to surrender all to him? Brothers and sisters, this is who we are. We are wretched. We are miserable. We are poor. We are blind. We are naked. But by his grace, once we understand that this is our true condition, Christ says that he will empower us he will cover us he will forgive us and he will allow us to be uh, be able to see and we'll be able to live rich in the abundance of his love meditate on his cross meditate on his love for you meditate on what he has done for you and i and i guarantee you as you continue to behold jesus on that cross your heart will be subdued to his love for you as we conclude let's bow our heads for a word of prayer father i just want to thank you again for allowing us to be reminded of our desperate need of you. Lord, our condition is that we're wretched, we're miserable, we're poor, we're blind, and we're naked. But Father, because you are not in our hearts is why we think we're rich, we're increased with goods, and we really have no need of anything. And so Father, today we want to surrender this to you. And what is the thing that you want? It is our hearts. Lord, we've realized that the one vital thing that we need in our experience is your love in our hearts. And so Father, please, Embrace us with your love. Allow us to understand more about your son and his great sacrifice for us. We love you. We thank you. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hi, YouTube. I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.